This is Mike Caruso, publisher of The Fisherman Magazine, and welcome to the September episode of The Fisherman TV. I'm here at Smith's Point State Park on the south shore of Long Island on a stormy, tropical day. But we'll start off on Cape Cod aboard the O-Search with Chris Fisher and his research team tagging great white sharks. This groundbreaking scientific data will help best manage the fishery well into the future. Next up, we join Captain Frank Crescitelli of Fin Chaser Charters as we fish the offshore canyons of New Jersey, targeting white marlin and tuna. We finish up on Long Island in Mattituck aboard the open boat Captain Bob, fishing for scup with some very competitive fishermen staffers. You'll learn some great tips along the way. So sit back and enjoy the Fisherman TV. <laughs> Hi, I'm Toby Lipinski, the managing editor of the New England edition of the Fisherman Magazine. Today we'll be joining Chris Fisher and the crew of the O-Search off the southeast corner of Cape Cod near Monomoy Island. The research vessel O-Search has spent the past month capturing and tagging great white sharks in an effort to better understand the life cycle and movements of the Atlantic population of the great white shark. So stay tuned as we learn a little bit more about the tagging program and the work being done with the data being collected. The process here is to, we're bait and switching these sharks here. We're on the anchor, there's current, we have seal decoys back, the sharks are coming in, they're totally fixated on the seals. They don't really want anything to do with just a bait, right? So we're teasing them, they're coming up on the teasers, we're cranking them in, they're biting the decoys. We have the decoys stuffed full of fish and guts and oily, oily things. And so, boom, they get a little flavor explosion, right? And then we tease them, we tease them, and we're keeping those seal decoys just right on the tip of their tongue. And when we come into the back of the boat, we flip it into the boat, and boom, there is a bait there with the same stuff that's inside the decoy. Once the sharks take a bait, you know, we go into hand lining them, and it's our objective really to kind of just get control of the animal as quickly as possible. We found that these sharks, if you get them in a lead, they want to follow. So if you can quickly get the shark into a lead, you can basically just walk the shark around and any sort of big fighting ends. So we try to quickly get the shark in a lead, then we slide buoys down toward its face, and those buoys lift the shark up, and for lack of a better word, it pins the shark to the surface of the water, you know, just about three feet under the water. And then we can walk the shark anywhere we want to go at that time, and we walk him back to the, to the ship, and we swing him over the lift, just like you swing a skier into the beach, and then boom, up comes the lift. Quickly then we go into, you know, a towel over the eyes, uh, big hoses on either side of its mouth for both gills. And we execute about 12 research projects in 15 minutes and then let them go um, as quick as we can. And, and our whole thing is, with all the work we're doing, if they don't swim away in good shape, it is all for naught. So that is why we do that. It's also just the right thing to do. We do, we do a series of studies when the shark is on the list, lift and we're trying to get it all done in 15 minutes. And when it comes to the tags, we have actually five different kinds of tags. The most obvious is a, is a spot tag, what we call a spot tag. And that tag is mounted at the very tip of the dorsal fin and it allows us to detect the presence of the shark when it's at the surface in almost real time. So that, that shark, when it comes up, will transmit to a satellite and we'll know where it is and put it up on the shark tracker. Yeah, one of, the, one of the major aspects of the study that we're doing here is to, to assess the level of stress in the shark itself, and we do that by taking blood samples. Now, the only way to take a blood sample is to have it up on the lift system. So we're able to quantify stress in the shark, you know, and how much it is, it is basically reacting to being caught online. You know, and we do that any time we catch a fish, right? We expose it to some level of stress. And what we're finding out in these white sharks is that even though we can fight them for as long as 45 minutes to get them in the lift system, get them up out of the water, the level of stress is remarkably low. The white shark's able to, to respond and recover from stress very, very rapidly. We're getting recovery times as low as two hours and as long as it's four hours. So now we have these accelerometer tags that can really tell us what the sharks are doing instead of just where they're going. We've been, we've been able to tell where they're going for a while now, which is awesome, but we always wonder, okay, why do they go to these different places? What are they actually up to? And so the accelerometer just uses the same technology that's found in your smartphone or your video game controller. Instead of tracking the movement of your hand in the case of a video game or the position of your cell phone, we use it to track the position and the movement of the shark. So we can record every single tail beat the animal makes second by second for days at a time. And now we're going for weeks at a time with, with uh, Betsy. 
So we have to recover these tags. We have to actually get them back from the shark to get the data. Seeing this thing bouncing around on the surface when we finally find it is just like the best site ever. Everyone can follow what we're doing in real time on the Facebook page. So we have filmmaking in the now, science in the now. The moment a shark is released, you can follow it on the tracker. So much has been revealed in the first year and you know how that is, you, you answer one question and it inspires three more that you didn't even know to ask previously. So we're starting to get in that second wave of questions. You know, we've had uh, Mary Lee, who we tagged here, went down to the southeast, rolled back up here to New York and then out and around Bermuda and she's back in the southeast right now. Jeannie, who we tagged here last year, rolled down south and is now back up here a few miles from here. So why did she come back and Mary Lee not? Maybe Mary Lee got pregnant and Jeannie didn't and Mary Lee's down there gestating babies in Gulf Stream warm water, and Jeannie's come back up here to try again. You know, we don't know, but we're starting to have data that fills in this massive void of, you know, the unknown. The white shark's range is much more massive than we thought here in the North Atlantic, and their movements are more dynamic than Dr. Scomble thought. They're moving all over the Atlantic. It's not just a north-south movement associated with the summer and the winter. They're moving way east out into the middle of the Atlantic and the North Atlantic. Um, the northeast and the southeast are really connected by the white sharks. Not only are they spending a lot of time on the coast up here in Cape Cod, but it appears they're spending a lot of time on the coast down in the southeast. If you go right over here to the beach in Cape Cod right now, a few years ago, they were talking about their sharks like they were scared to death. Now they're talking about their sharks over here like they want to love on them, understand them, and figure out what's going on. And that might be just as important as everything we learn from a scientific standpoint. Why would we expect anyone else other than the recreational fishermen to save the ocean? They love it the most. We got to activate the rec community to come together with the science community to explode the data on every fishery so we have the best data we've ever had so we can manage the ocean in the most centrist data-driven way so that all of our kids can enjoy it too. And instead of complaining, I mean, we're trying to inspire the wreck fishermen. I mean, all we are is a, a group of recreational fishermen coming together with a group of world-class scientists on a massive global scale. The recreational fishery is responsible for 2% of the take. So, we can sit here and discuss the guy who has a shark fishing tournament who hangs a few sharks and it's statistically moot. Or we can talk about the 200,000 sharks that were finned today. So I'm a data-driven guy. If I, if, I stop, if I spend my time and energy worrying about the shark tournament versus the guy who's finning a 200,000 a year, I'm not gonna make an impact. I'm gonna waste my time chasing things that don't statistically move the needle. So when I, when I talk about shark tournaments, where they're kill tournaments, do I say, is it poor leadership? Absolutely poor leadership. If we can inspire some grassroots recreational anglers to do what we're doing in their own world, I think that would be hugely powerful for the future of the ocean. After a foggy end to the day, we're back here at the Chatham Bars Inn, the home base on land for the O-Search crew. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. For the Fisherman TV, I'm Toby Lipinski. What's more exciting than catching a big fish? Catching a big fish and winning a new boat. Or a fishing trip to Zancudo Lodge in Costa Rica. How? Just be a Fisherman subscriber and weigh in your catch. Hello, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Fisherman TV. I'm your host today, John DeBona, the advertising manager of the New Jersey Delaware Bay edition of the Fisherman Magazine. Brace yourself for one heck of a ride and one awesome show as we set sail at a beach haven for tuna aboard this 32-foot regulator center console with Captain Frank Crescitelli of Fin Chaser Charters. Destination, the Wilmington Canyon. So today we head out to the Wilmington Canyon where we had fish the last two times out. It didn't take long for us to find out that we were right choosing Wilmington because we had a nice yellowfin on right away. Uh, we dropped it at the leader. You know, it seems the smaller they are, the harder they are to land, you know. And, uh, but you know they're there, you know the spread's working, so that's a great sign. Tuna. Come on, someone get a belt on. I don't think you need to pull hard as you try
forward frame. Oh. After we, uh, you know, we dropped that one tuna fish, it slowed down a little bit. So you're trying to figure out what's happening. The water didn't look great. We didn't have great temperature breaks. So you try and figure out what are you doing wrong? What can I do to be proactive? So you observe your surroundings. Using you know, the Ray Marine with the digital radar, you can see stuff perfectly clear. And we saw that there was four commercial vessels in this one area on 100 line, and they're not gonna be in a place that's not productive. So we picked up, rather than troll and take an hour to get there, we pick up and we get there and boom, as soon as we're there, we see that there's bait on the fish finder. We tuned it in. We saw some little bait. And then right away, we had a white mall on pole. You got to get on this. We got a nice white here. Johnny, now. Ready? I don't have the belt on, but stay tight. Stay tight. Keep pressing. Keep the fork, right? Hey, John. Just a little bump. No, no, no. Little bump. Little bump. Yeah, keep pressing. Keep pressing. Woo! Look at that fish jumping. Oh, Look at that fish jumping. Great. jumping out there. Come on, get them shorts. Get them. Right here, right here, lock in. We'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Don't wind it. Don't wind it. All right, Johnny, I'm going to come down on it. Don't wind it. Oh, boy. Hold on that bar. You need to make sure you drop it. You can hit that bar. He's close, Frank. We're close. Let's go. He's got it. He's got good pressure right now. Keep cranking. Got a little fish. Got a little Johnny. Keep him in that water, Frank. There he is. Nice! Good one. Good job. 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 Good and it's a great release and that that's people have tried for white mullen many many times and not get them for johnny to get it on his first trip well that's the way johnny bones does it so we land that one white marlin it wasn't soon after we landed that fish picked up set the spread out again and we had another one dive on the 80 on the short flat there he is i got him sean clear your line go over top sean Am I over you or stop? The one thing about a white mullen that people may or may not know is that they are probably the hardest billfish to hook. They're finicky, first of all. They have a very small mouth. All billfish have hard mouths. Uh, a lot of time the bill is in the way of the hook set, and they're very challenging. The one thing about going to the canyon is you have to remember the ocean is a desert, and the fish are in the oasises. So how do you find the oasis? So you got to find these little clues little tuna chicks on the water. You know, two pieces of water push it up against each other to make a little bit of a seam or a rip, uh, you call it inshore. Or, you know, working the contour, using the depth finder to find a contour in a canyon and pushing up the wall and work the edge and, you know, zigzag instead of trolling straight. All these little things, you know, something doesn't work, change your approach. Is it working? Not working. If it's working, keep it. If not, throw it out, do something else.
So, you know, all day long we were, we were big eye hunting. Uh, we decided to leave the place where we did have a nice yellowfin and a marlin to go back to the place where we started to try and find the big eye. And it paid off. We weren't trolling five minutes and we had that big eye bite. Yeah. There you go. Keep spinning the boat, guys. Clear them lines. The important thing about those fish, though, is they swim very, very fast. And when they have a lot of line out, you get a belly in the line. They can just change direction. Keep going, Frank. Keep going. And it does happen where they'll swim at you. And if the boat's not in gear or you're not reeling fast enough, it just takes a split second. Keep Don't even lift it up Keep reeling. Keep reeling. Reel, reel, reel. You should have fight back by now. What made it easy on me today, we had Sean Gross from Ray Marine fine-tuning the electronics for me. William Jarvis, who's probably one of the best young anglers ever guided in my life. Put him on the bow, he spotted the whales, he was looking for the tuna fish, got to see a lot of cool stuff today, a white marlin, tuna fish, and uh, Richie from CTS Rods. Great to have Richie on board with testing gear out and stuff like that. And, you know, my main number one mate, Wayne Price, who does it, makes it all happen for me. He makes me look good. Wow, what an exciting trip, especially for me. I caught my first ever white marlin. And I can't thank Captain Frank Crescitelli enough for helping us bring you this exciting episode. Always remember, safety should be your first priority when considering heading offshore. This is John DeBona for the Fishman TV. Till next time. Hi folks, I'm Tom Schlichter for the Fisherman Magazine. We're out here on the east end of Long Island Sound fishing aboard the open boat Captain Bob and our target is mixed bag action. I'm out with Mike Fanagrossi, our advertising sales manager, and we want to see which one of us can put the most fish in the bucket. Tom will be going down today. He'll be watching me just reeling fish after fish all afternoon. So. Be ready, be aware, Tom. I'm coming for you. The race is on. Speak softly, carry a big stick. Tom, I see your thumb isn't very educated. You're getting a little bird nesting <laughs> action going on there. Oh, thank God I'm not using braid today. <laughs> You're, you're kidding me. He's got a banana on the boat. Oh. Don't you know what bananas do to the fishing? Oh, man. He's killing us. That's a good banana. Uh, Mike brought that banana aboard. That could put the skunk on the day. But this hat? That lucky hat is the antidote to bananas. Yeah, the hat's not going to help him catch any fish. It's going to help his head to be protected from the sun. <laughs> Nothing too big here, but it's nice to get something on the end of the line. There you go, Mike. Where are the boat here? Yeah. Ah, see, so you put on that hat. First thing you got to bite, right off the bat. So luck, right there, every time. This is how we do it, Tom, nice and steady. Feel good, Mike? What do you got? Yeah, feels like a nice fork. Don't tangle my line on your way up there, right? I'm trying to, to keep you out of the water. I'm trying to keep, keep you out. And just got to jump in Oh. We catch them two at a time here. This is how the young guns do it. Two at a time. Not one at a time. Young guns? 
<laughs> we'll see. Experience will win out by the end of the day. Two at a time. That's how we do it around here. One at a time, that takes too long. Two at a time. That double trouble. Give him that one. Keep reeling. Keep reeling. Come on. Look at that sea bass. There's a gorgeous sea yes. bass, Tommy. There's a sea bass, Tommy. Woo. You know, I'm over here having this competition with Mike, and the little guys are showing us up. Brandon nailed this beautiful sea bass. How'd that one fight, Brandon? Pretty hard. Yeah? Did you, you have to take a while to get him up? Yeah. I tell you, it's what it's all about, man. Oh. Start moving the numbers. Moving the numbers. Show them how to do this. Mike, you sure don't have a big striper on the end there? Poggy time! Outside. Everybody's into a fish. Let's go. Now we're working it. Come on. Hey. One of the things I like to do is get my line all the way to the bottom and then just lift nice and gentle. A little bit. Feel a little extra weight. You set the hook. <laughs> I can't believe it. And you're in. Simple as that. Look at that, look, come on, George! Look at the knife! Oh, there we go. Hey Mike, you know, the more experienced among us learn to hook those fish to the lips. <laughs> there we go, alright, that one's putting a good bend in. Mike's still unhooking that last fish. This will give me a chance to put a little distance between us. There he is. See it? Just like I told you. Hooked right in the lip. That's the way to do it. Easy release. We got the Mike got the wreck. I think I got a whale. Got the wreck there, huh? I have the Titanic. Nice. Don't grab that. Look, this big. I think that's the first guy to catch the wreck all day. He's going to be retying now. It's my chance to get ahead. about the hat. Time to fight fire with fire. Put the lucky hat on. Combat Tom's lucky hat. I'll get my own mojo going. One of the things that makes for a great party boat experience is a good captain and a good crew. Captain Bob has been out on these waters on Eastern Long Island Sound for over 30 years. I fished with him a lot over that time. He knows how to put the boat on the fish. And his crew, those guys come up and down, always right there when you need them. We're in Mattatuck, and Mattatuck is such a great area from here, the entire North Fork, all the way out to Orient Point. It ha it's just beautiful. People should come this way, fish this way, and enjoy it. Children, adults, there's so much fishing for both, and uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to explain. It's sort of like set back in time a little bit, and we have excellent fishing out here. Our crew and our captains have been with the Captain Bob fishing fleet for most of them between 30 and 40 years. They've served a lifetime sentence with me. Uh, lo lots of good men, excellent mates on deck, attending to the people, love to teach people how to fish, and just love their jobs. And we're, we're, we're here to please everybody, from the young person to the oldest person, and they have to come to experience this in Long Island Sound, they'll love it. So we had a great day today fishing aboard the Captain Bob. We had a mix of bottom species including porgy, sea bass, we got a couple of bluefish, a striped bass. Mike and I had a competition going. It was a uh, type of day where we just lost count of fish, right Mike? That's right Tom. I'd like to thank Captain Bob also for having us out today. I appreciate it very much. It was a great time, great afternoon, a lot of fish. If you want to bring your family out, this is a great way to get kids started. It's a great way to just spend a day together and have a ball. From the waters of East in Long Island Sound. I'm Tom Schlichter with Mike Fanagrossi for the Fisherman TV. Porgy and Chips Nader style, a creation you'll only see here on the Fisherman TV. Today is Porgy Day. Those are scaled already and got it. You're gonna dry, make sure they're dry, very important. So the flour will stick. The flour, the pepper, 
A little salt, shake it up, take these guys, flour them, put some flour inside also, keep them moist. The trick right here, so to be easier to eat them without eating the bones, just make a little like a map, go like this, see? And then you just make a little path around the bone. Stomach here, so just start from here, same thing, and end up here. So this is what you're eating, same thing here, right? Get some potatoes. This already thin sliced, soaked in water. We're gonna drain them. Put them back in here. We're gonna make sure they're dry. Very important. Otherwise, they will never get crispy. Now we're gonna put some oil for the porgies. So I have oil in both. One for the fish and one for the chip. Now we're gonna put the porgy. Always put them out so you don't burn yourself. All right? Same thing, all the way to the out. And then you shake so you get the oil all over the porgies. And once you put the porgies, you do not move them. Because you now they're building a crust. So you really don't want to move them. The more you move them, the more they're not going to get crispy. Now we're going to put them in the oven for about uh, 15 minutes. And uh, in seven minutes, we're going to flip them. Okay, now we got the potato that's already dry. And we're going to put them in the hot oil. See? Just put them so they don't stay on top of each other. So each one of them will be crispy on its own. Right, now we're gonna put them in the oven for seven, eight minutes. Now we're gonna make the sauce of the porgy, which is the most important part. We're gonna put a little garlic, minced garlic, just about maybe a teaspoon, a little pinch of dry oregano, a little diced cherry pepper, I like a little bit spicy, add a little a little zip to the uh, porgies, a little bit fresh lemon or lime juice, a little chopped basil and parsley together, a little olive oil, and then you just stir everything. This is when the porgy is going to come out, we're going to lay it down, so this on the top, nice and cold, and it's going to give this amazing flavor and nice color to the porgy. Okay, now we're going to see if the porgies are crispy. Now you flip them. Now we're gonna put them for about seven, eight minutes in the oven. Okay, well now it's porgy time. Let's check the porgies. Look at that. Huh? Beautiful color. And then let's check on the fries. Ah, uh, look at that. You wanna get rid of that oil? Pull it in a napkin or something just to get rid of that oil. And then you put salt and pepper at the end. When you're ready to eat, huh? Look at that, Mamma Mia, look how beautiful. Thanks for watching the September episode of The Fisherman TV. And remember all the great benefits you get as being a subscriber to The Fisherman Magazine. September, October, great months for catching trophy fish and entering them into the Dreamboat Challenge. Good luck, and we'll see you in October.